This next segment of the lecture will talk about the different types of variables that we use. Uh, specifically, what types of numbers are we using in our analyses? So we're going to identify the different type of variable measurements. Now this is going to be important for everything we do throughout the remainder of the semester because once we get past the basics and statistics, we're going to start talking about hypothesis tests or statistical tests. And so the types of variables that we use or that we use for, for measurement for the values that we get determine the types of tests that we can run. Also, each of these statistical tests comes with a set of assumptions. And some of these tests require particular types of variables. So we need to know the types of variables that we're working with. In other words, the types of data that we're collecting. And then finally, uh, the types of variables will tell us what we can do mathematically. That with some types of variables, we can't perform certain mathematical functions, such as multiplying or dividing or adding or subtracting. So we need to know the types of variables that we're using. We need to be able to categorize them. And so let's go ahead and let's talk about the different types of variables used in statistics. There are four types of variables that can be categorized into two types of observations. Those two observations are called continuous observations and discrete observations. Now, continuous observations are also called scale or score observations. And continuous scale or score observations uh, consist of ratio variables and interval variables. And just as it sounds, continuous variables are continuous on the number line. That means you can have an infinite number of points between two whole numbers. In other words, you have decimals. Now, the other type of observation is discrete observation. And there's two types of discrete observations. There are ordinal variables and nominal variables. And being discrete observations means you don't have any decimals. They're just whole numbers. Some statisticians like to start with the variable that you can do the least with ma mathematically. But I personally like to start with the, the one that you can do the most with. And that's ratio variables. So we'll start there and then we'll move down from ratio to interval to ordinal and then to nominal variables. Ratio variables are a type of continuous observation. And again, continuous could mean scale or score observations. Those terms are used synonymously. Uh, so with a continuous observation, you have equal distances between numbers. In other words, the numbers themselves are continuous. So we can divide n between numbers in an infinite number of ways. And so in other words, what we're saying is that we have decimal places. And we can have an infinite number of places within that decimal. So ratio variables have equal distances between their numbers. They're continuous observations. Uh, they have what's also called a meaningful zero point. And what we mean by that is that there's an absolute absence of whatever it is we're measuring. So there'll be a zero point, and that zero point will mean the absolute absence of whatever the, whatever the, the construct is that we're measuring. And because it has a zero point, the ratio variable allows us to multiply and divide in a meaningful way. So what I mean by that is that when we multiply or divide, we can say that a particular number, let's say 6, is twice as much as 3. Or we can say 10 is half as much as 20. In other words, we're creating ratios. And that's why it's called a ratio variable. So some examples of ratio variables are the Kelvin scale. So Kelvin is a measure of temperature. So we're familiar with Fahrenheit. That's what we use most often here in the United States. Uh, sometimes uh, you've seen Celsius scales of temperature. Now both Fahrenheit and Celsius have the number zero in there. In fact, in Celsius, the number zero represents the freezing point. And in Fahrenheit, the number 32 represents uh, so 32 degrees would represent the freezing point. But neither of those are absolute zeros. So at zero Celsius, or 32 degrees Fahrenheit, there is still temperature. And so temperature is measured in the molecules that are vibrating. So if molecules are vibrating, then there are there is a temperature. So the Kelvin scale, however, uh, when we have zero Kelvin, is called an absolute zero. That means that the molecules at zero Kelvin have stopped moving. There is no temperature. And that's what we mean by an absolute absence. And so the Kelvin scale, when it comes to temperature, has an absolute zero. It is a ratio variable. That 60 degrees Kelvin is twice as hot 
as 30 degrees Kelvin. So other types of ratio variables might include income that I could have zero dollars in my wallet and that would be the absolute absence of money in my wallet. So that would be a ratio variable. So if I have ten dollars and you have twenty dollars you have twice as much money as me and so we can create a ratio and so that's a ratio variable. Interval variables are also continuous observations in other words scale or score observations and in fact they're very similar to ratio variables in that you also have equal distances between numbers with interval variables in other words you can have decimal places you can divide infinitely between any two whole numbers and get decimals uh, and you can also add and subtract like you can with ratio variables but the big difference is that with interval variables you don't have a meaningful zero point in other words, you don't have a zero that represents the absolute absence of your measurement. And so because of that, we can't multiply or divide meaningfully with interval variables. And so a good example is the Fahrenheit scale when it comes to temperature. We're all familiar with the Fahrenheit scale uh, so that we, have, we can have a zero degrees Fahrenheit, but there's still temperature there. So we have the zero point, but it doesn't represent the absolute absence of temperature which is what we're measuring. And so we can't meaningfully multiply or divide when it comes to the Fahrenheit scale. So in other words, 60 degrees Fahrenheit is not twice as hot as 30 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's because we don't have that absolute zero point. The most common application of interval variables is usually response scales. And you've seen response scales before, so you may be asked your opinion, let's say on a type of food and how much you like it, and so at one end it might be a one to five scale and then five is you really like it and one is you don't like it at all and so at the bottom end of the scale the one is not an absolute zero point so even if you don't like it at all it's still not zero and so in that case it would be an intervals, interval variable so we'll talk about response scales, scales in a little bit of more detail but just realize that the big difference between interval and ratio variables is that zero point that if the zero point and the values that are being collected does not represent the absolute absence of, of the variable being measured, of the measurement, then it is an interval scale. If it has a meaningful zero point, that means the zero represents the absolute absence of what's being measured, then it is a ratio variable and can be categorized as such. Let's go ahead and talk about discrete observations now. So we said there are two different types of discrete observations. The first one that we're going to talk about is ordinal variables. So when you hear the term ordinal, just think of that the order matters. So ordinal order. And so what we're talking about here is rankings. And so these are whole numbers, so we don't have decimals. So we rank something maybe first, second, third, or fourth, or firstborn, secondborn, thirdborn, whatever it may be, but they're ranked in some particular order. Maybe it's your favorite type of ice cream. And so with rankings, we don't have decimal places, and we just have a particular order. And so we can only classify things as greater than or less than. So mathematically, we can't add or subtract meaningfully, uh, and we can't multiply or divide meaningfully. We can only determine something is greater or less than something else. So for example, in winners of a race, someone who is in first place is faster than, let's say, someone who is in second place or third place. And so we can determine greater than or less than but we really don't determine just how much faster uh, one person is from another. Uh, also preferences, so, so in this case maybe it's a type of ice cream. We can order or rank the types of ice cream to our most to our least favorite or least favorite to our most favorite. Same thing with birth order or class standing, first year, second year, third year, fourth year. And so we can, we can provide rankings uh, and those rankings will be particular values or numbers. And if that's the case, then we have ordinal variables. The last type of variable is the nominal variable. When I think of nominal variables, I think of names of categories, because that's exactly what a nominal variable is. It's a categorization. And so sometimes this is called grouping a grouping variable. And so for example, uh, we may have gender and so maybe I assign the value or the number one to males and twos to females and so for every male that I have I give it a category of a one or each person becomes a one 
And for each female I have, the category becomes a two, so I assign the number two to each female. And so all I've really done is created two, two categories of males and females, and I've assigned them numbers. And that would be a nominal variable. Now with nominal variables, we can't do anything mathematically. We can't multiply or divide. We can't add or subtract. And we can't determine more than or less than. So being assigned a number of two does not mean that you're greater than the group that's assigned the number of one. So if we assign females two and males one, we're not saying that females are greater at anything than, than males. We're just categorizing them, putting them into groups. Additionally, we can't add uh, or subtract them. I can't take one for males plus two for females and get three that is some sort of hybrid of males and females. Well, that wouldn't make sense. And so we can't do much mathematically with nominal variables, but it is helpful to group our observations uh, into numbers, and that's what nominal variables are for. So some other examples might be class standing or ethnicity. I can assign numbers to, to particular classes or to particular ethnicities. So you're probably wondering, well, how can a, a nominal variable such as class standing also be an ordinal variable, uh, as you see in the example above? Uh, and the answer is it depends on the context and how you're using it. If you're talking about seniors uh, being their fourth year as opposed to freshmen being their first year, then you're talking about an ordinal variable. But if you're looking at class standing as just a category, so maybe we assign freshmen as one, sophomores as two, uh, uh, juniors as three, and seniors as four, and we're not trying to determine one being greater than or less than the other or further along in the program or not as far along in the program. And now we're talking about a nominal variable. So it's important to remember that with nominal variables that the number you assign the groups is fairly arbitrary. And so I could take class standing and assign freshmen as one, uh, sophomores as two, juniors as three, and seniors as four, or I could assign uh, freshmen as 237, uh, sophomores as 17, juniors as 32, and seniors as neg negative 110. And it doesn't really matter because it's just a number that represents a category. Uh, the numbers have no other particular meaning. And so realize that uh, in a lot of cases, the types of variable that you have depends on the context, and the context is important. How is that number being used? If it's being used just to, to group uh, people together, then it's a nominal variable. If the, if, if the variable is being used to determine some sort of ranking, then now we're talking about an ordinal variable. And so you can have things like class standing be represented by different types of variables. What matters is the context. How is it being used? So that leads me to variable ambiguity. In other words, exceptions when we're categorizing the types of variables that we have. So the type of variable depends largely on the context. In other words, how it's being used. To find the context, we have to look at the operational definition. And we've talked about operational definitions already. So an example might be continuous scales. Continuous scales are often dichotomized into nominal variables. In other words, we can take a continuous scale, let's say temperature, and we can categorize uh, anything above 70 degrees as warm. And so maybe we give it a number of 1. And then anything below 70 degrees, we might categorize as 2 as being cold. In which case, we've now taken a, a continuous observation, a interval uh, variable, and now we've made it a nominal variable. So we have to pay attention to the context. The context is going to tell us what type of variable is being used. So it's not clear cut when it comes to identifying the type of variable. And this is something that you'll see throughout the rest of the semester is identifying the types of variables that you have. And in some cases, uh, it'll be it'll seem quite difficult. Uh, and, and some of you will struggle with it throughout the semester. And so we want to try to be as clear as possible earlier in the semester rather than later so that you're, you're categorizing your variables correctly. So another exception to categorizing the type of variable that you use for research is that some variables could be treated as interval or ratio depending on the culture or, or again the context. So a really good example of this is age. So the question that I would like to ask you and just think about for a second is at what point do we begin to age? In other words, at what point do we start counting how old 
someone is. Like most people here in the United States, we begin counting age at birth. In other words, the moment that that the child leaves the birth canal of the mother, we start the clock and say, okay, now this child is aging, and a year after that point, uh, the child's one year old. Three years after that, that birthing point, the child is three years old. Uh, but the argument is that, well, the child existed prior to being born. It just was in the womb of the mother. And so if that's the case, then when does age really begin? Uh, is it at birth? Is it at conception? Is it prior to conception? And so it becomes more of a philosophical question. And so if if age as a zero point is when when time begins is arbitrary depending on our culture, then it should be classified as an interval variable. But here in the United States, we classify it as a ratio variable. So in other countries, uh, birth does not begin. I'm sorry, age does not begin at birth. But rather, if you're in, in the Koreas, you start age at conception. Uh, in fact, by the time you're born, you're already considered to be one years old. And also, depending on the type of year, you could even be considered to be two years old. And so it's culturally defined. From a philosophical perspective, uh, we would never really have a beginning. Because age begins before conception. That certainly you existed before the sperm of your father and the egg of your mother met and and uh, and germinated, and so in which case you existed as DNA of your your parents and of their of their parents and of their parents' parents and so on back to the beginning of time, whenever that may be, and so in this particular case, age. If that zero point is arbitrary, then it should be treated as an interval variable. But again, like I mentioned, in the United States, we treat it as a ratio variable. The last exception I'd like to talk about are response scales. And so response scales are, are typically those self-report measures uh, where you may be asked to how much you agree to something or disagree on something on a 1 to 5 scale or a 1 to 10 scale or a 0 to 6 scale, whatever it may be. And so response scales are treated as interval or ratio variables, although technically they're discrete observations, technically they're ordinal variables. But for convenience and for statistical analyses, we treat them as interval or ratio. We can run more powerful tests with response scales if we treat them as interval or ratio rather than uh, ordinal, which they technically are. And so we'll talk about distinguishing between the different types of response scales and categorizing them as interval or ratio here in a, in a few slides from here. Um, but the point I really want to, to talk about or mention is that when we categorize the type of variable that we're using, the context matters. And so if we want to find out what that context is, often we'll have to go back and we'll have to look at the operational definitions. How is it that the researcher is using this particular number or this particular variable and that'll tell us the context and that will help us categorize the type of variable that we have. Because response scales can be difficult to categorize to the type of variable that's being used, let's go ahead and spend some time talking about response scales. So response scales themselves are what we call indirect measurements. They're self-reports of particular constructs. So an example might be pain. So pain is fairly subjective. Some people are more tolerant to pain than other people. Some people may not be able to tolerate pain well at all. And so just a, the little bit amount of pain can be excruciating for them. And so uh, we try to, to measure it indirectly by asking each person just how much pain they're in. And so one of those scales is called the faces pain scale. And you may have seen a faces pain scale before. But I'll go ahead and let the, the following video introduce you to the Faces Pain Scale.